Uh, Dr. Modik, are you ready? Can we start? Uh, yeah, I'm ready. I'll just oh, need fine. to share my okay. screen whenever. Okay, okay. Thank you. So let us start today's session. The first talk will be delivered by Dr. Prashanu Modik. And uh, this will be the second talk in his particular session and the last one. And uh, he will be delivering the topic on the topic as analysis of our models using stochastic approximation. So I invite Dr. Molik to start his lecture. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ghosh, uh, for the invitation. Uh, so let me share the screen first. Yeah. Is the screen visible? Yeah, it's coming. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So as I mentioned last time, uh, so my my aim of this uh, series of two lectures was to explain analysis of ARN models uh, using stochastic approximation. To that end, I spent the last talk uh, in introducing stochastic approximation, which is uh, quite an interesting and powerful tool on its own. And obviously, as I mentioned last time, I didn't uh, 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 didn't cover the entire spectrum or power of the uh, tool called stochastic approximation. I developed it only uh, uh, for the purpose of using it for the ARN models. So while I didn't uh, explore all the uh, uh, applications of stochastic uh, approximation or all sort of assumptions, uh, on the other hand, I uh, explained some uh, new or additional features that uh, Ujan and I developed to use stochastic approximation for ARN models. Uh, so I'll, I'll quickly recall uh, stochastic approximation, uh, the results that we obtained last time uh, when we go there. But before that, uh, let me uh, first describe what an ARN model is uh, and what aspect of ARN model we are trying to study and what sort of results uh, what are known and what, what will be our contribution. And then uh, I'll recall stochastic approximation, and I'll end with a very broad and sketch of of, uh, of what would, would be the proof. Actually, there there will be there will be a lot of steps which I'll obviously be uh, pushing under the carpet because they will be quite technically involved. So first, the ARN model. This is one of the oldest uh, models in uh, stochastic process. It was developed or introduced uh, uh, in the probability literature uh, towards the end of uh, 20s and early 30s. So that's about 90 years back, uh, 20, uh, 20s and early 20s, early 30s of last century. That's about 90 years back by George Polier and his co-authors. Uh, it's a very simple model uh, as uh, was introduced by Polia. Uh, interestingly, we'll not be uh, looking at, uh, I mean, the assumptions that we'll be making will exclude Polia's ARN model. Uh, they are a very different kind of object, will require different sort of analysis, but uh, since then, the Polia's ARN model has been uh, looked into, it has been uh, modified and or generalized and found application in many things, uh, starting from uh, database management, sorting algorithms, reinforced learning, and a lot, lot many other things. Uh, so without uh, much further ado, let me get into the model. So. Arn is like a bean, and there will be balls of k different colors. Uh, for the purpose of the present lecture, we'll be taking k to be finite and fixed. But a lot of interesting features come in when you allow infinitely many colors. Uh, in fact, there have been recent developments 
uh, recent means over like last two, three years, where uh, you can consider uh, the space of colors to be indexed by some complex separable matrix space. So it can be pretty abstract, but uh, let's stick uh, to the finite number of colors for, for the current lecture. So the, the, the crucial uh, vector that we'll be considering is CN. Uh, so uh, for, for this lecture, all the vectors will be row vectors. When we need column vectors, I'll uh, put a transpose uh, uh, T on top of the vector. So what is a con uh, configuration vector? It's a ve vector of row vector of dimension K. Uh, so I'll make repeated trials so this will be the configuration of the urn after n trial. And what does it give? Uh, so the ith coordinate of the vector Cn will give the amount of ith color that's in the urn. So C1 will Cn1 will be the amount of first color, Cn2 will be the amount of second color, and so on. And there is a reason. So I'm saying it's bald, so when I uh, talk about amount, it's natural to think of no, uh, as number of balls. Uh, but we'll be using the word amount for a space, and, and the number of balls will be non-negative integers, right? But we'll be using the word amount uh, very deliberately. I, th there is no reason why these numbers have to be non-negative integers. They, they will work perfectly fine, as I shall describe, as long as they are not negative reals. Uh, so, I mean, uh, it would be a bit weird to think of a fractional number or maybe an irrational number of balls. So, if you are very uh, uncomfortable with this thing, a uh, good uh, solution or good uh, uh, mitigation of this problem will be to consider this R as one of those. Uh, color mixing machines that these uh, modern paint shops have. So when you uh, decide on uh, getting your house painted, uh, so you go to the go to a, a paint shop to choose your favorite color paints. And nowadays they don't, uh, I mean, if you have been there recently, you would know that they don't keep those uh, uh, things of ca uh, colors uh, of different shades. So they, what they have is they have a color mixing machine and they have like a few basic colors, a bit more than the primary colors. And then depending on the shade that you want, they uh, add a different amount of uh, colors uh, and uh, provide you the shade that you need. Uh, so, I mean, if you think of similar such thing, then uh, being color, it can be the volume and then it being fraction or irrational uh, shouldn't be too outrageous. So, whatever be it, so Cn is a vector in R plus power k. So, it has, it's a k-dimensional vector with non-negative real numbers as coordinates and the ith coordinate is the amount of k color after any trial. And F script Fn is all the information that you have until time n. So what you do at any trial is you go and pick a color at random from the color available. So uh, what you know is the, uh, the amount of i color before the n trial, that's n of n minus one at trial, is C n minus one i. That's why it's by our uh, uh, definition of the configuration. So you choose a color at random. So you choose a color in pro with a probability in proportion to the amount of color present. So you your probability of so given all the information that you have till that time, that is if given if f of n minus one, you choose i color with uh, the probability. Uh, proportional to C n minus one i. Uh, so uh, to so since uh, there are only finitely many colors, uh, I don't really have to 
worry too much. I scale it by uh, total amount of colors. So you sum over all j equal to 1 to k. And uh, that will give you the probability of choosing i color given all the past information. And I write it formally like this. The color chosen in the nth step will be denoted by this vector chi n. And rather than uh, having it as a uh, scalar and using the numbers 1, 2, up to k, uh, algebraically it's more convenient to consider chi n as a vector as well, a row vector as well. And choosing the i color will be denoted by i n being the i -th coordinate vector. So is the selection mechanism clear? So at i -th, uh, at the nth step, I choose i -th color in with probability in proportion to the amount of i -th color present. Any questions? Okay, so with that, I mean, uh, then after choosing the, uh, selecting the color, I'll add balls or paint as you wish uh, of different colors, but the amount that I will add, that will be random and that will depend on the color I choose. So I'll choose something, I'll add something. If I choose color one, I, if I choose color two, then I'll add something else and so on. So a good way to summarize what I add is using this replacement matrix, which I'll be call, uh, calling Rn. So the re recall that chi n is the color that I choose at n x t. And chi n is, the ith coordinate vector, ith coordinate row vector, if I choose ith color. So what is chi n times rn if uh, chi n is ei, the ith co uh, row coordinate vector? It's nothing but the ith row of rn. So that's what I was saying. So depending on what color I choose, I'll add different amounts of each color. And so I have a rule if I choose the first color, which will be nothing but the first row of this replacement matrix. If I choose second color, then I'll add the second row of this replacement matrix and so on. So I had the configuration C and minus one and I add the appropriate row of Rn depending on what color I choose and I get C and that's my evolution equation. So is this clear? Any questions? So I choose a color at random and based on the color chosen, I add some more color. Now, what are the properties of Rn? Uh, so as I said, this Rn can be random. I'll put some uh, distributional assumption on that. It can have non-negative, it, it will have only non-negative entries. Uh, actually, for certain purposes like <coughs> database management, in, it's important to allow negative diagonals as well. But for the time being, I'll not insist upon that. Uh, we'll, I mean, it's not too difficult to extend it to uh, ones with uh, negative diagonals, but that will uh, bring in a lot more uh, complication uh, in, in the analysis. So, I, I mean, it's, it's, it will be notationally more clumsy. Uh, so, I'll, I'll just uh, avoid that. And Rn will have finite mean in the sense each of the n each of the k square coordinates of Rn will have finite mean. In fact, uh, we'll even see that uh, I'll give it by uh, I'll uh, I'll have a I'll define appropriate norm for this matrix, and uh, it will be same as saying the corresponding. Uh, norm has finite mean because it's all finite dimensional. So there is not much difficulty, but when you do uh, infinite color uh, on, uh, you have to be very careful about what exactly you are saying. And when you talk about this randomness, this is a condition that I uh, imply 
so things can depend on past but given the past your choice of the color and the addition rule so rn is a replacement matrix its addition rule they should be conditionally independent dependence on the past is uh, is required from one of the critical applications of arn model which is in clinical trial design but such trials for such trials while it's important to have dependence on the past uh this conditional independence is somewhat acceptable so we can this is sort of the most general setup of uh arn model that you can think of except some of the problems will require the diagonals to be uh, negative uh, and also you may have infinite color uh, there, there is no requirement on the entries of rns to be integers as long as they are non negative reals we have okay now why we insist on non negative entry what can happen what can go wrong if we have negative entries so what are we doing what we are doing we are adding the appropriate row of rn to the past configuration now if the entries are negative and you are adding that that will correspond to taking away some amount of color from the past configuration and then you can only take away as much amount as it is there you cannot take away more than that right so uh i mean whenever you have uh, you put in some negative entries here you have to ensure that the sum doesn't end up having a negative entry so there there uh, there are certain conditions which you have to be imposed which are called tenability conditions and things like that so to avoid those technicalities let's not get into that also you can avoid being negative by truncating at uh, you know like just considering the positive part there a uh, lot of uh, ways these things are handled but all of them will uh, involve a lot of technicalities and i don't want to get into that so this is a model is a model clear any questions on the model okay if not we need to bring in some notations you already have this notation cn the configuration vector and then sn is the sum of the coordinates uh, which is a total number of uh, total color count or total color amount i should say after in a trial so if you add how much is the total number of points and uh, why not is the uh, amount of total amount of color you start with and yn is how much total uh, amount of colors that you add at each level sn minus sn minus 1 so just by uh, thinking of the evolution equation it cn is equal to cn minus 1 plus chi n rn so it will be just nothing but chi n rn and then some of that vector so chi n rn one transpose remember one transpose is a column vector so when i have i put a transpose i have a column vector and when i don't put a transpose this is a row vector which is a bit non standard but i'll stick to that and the other important thing that i have so sn is a total color count cn is a configuration and n n is a color count vector so it's sum of the chi n so what does it say it's a, again a k vector whose i th coordinate tells you how many times you choose that i th color okay so this so i'll i'll study the asymptotics of this cn sn and nn this three outcomes that's the aim of this discussion so for a matrix a i'll use this uh, norm which is rho of a which is a maximum absolute rho sum and if you think it as an operator you can uh, think it of as a l1 little l1 little l1 operator norm uh but the crucial thing is it's the maximum of the absolute row sums and since our entries of the matrix are non negative it's a maximum row sum 
And similarly, I it will also be important to look at the minimum row sum that our minimum absolute row sum for us it doesn't make any difference because all our entries are non-negative. Uh, this will not, not be anything uh, related to norms or the matrix or anything. The first one is uh, that becomes very crucial when we discuss infinite dimensional things. Uh, but this last one is also uh, important. Uh, because what we shall see soon is that we'll be uh, invoking peron frobenius theorem and uh, we have to think of some infinite dimensional analog of uh, peron frobenius in some sense. And that's where uh, this uh, minimum absolute prosum becomes important. So I'll, I'll mention when I get there. So remember the Rn was the addition rule, it's a replacement matrix. And what becomes crucial is they're, they're all random. So you have to use their average, but every time I use them, I know the past until time in minus one. So it's good, uh, important to look at their expectation, but the conditional expectation, and that is denoted by H of N minus one, and that's generally called generating matrix in the literature, so I'll use that name. So Rn is the replacement matrix and Hn minus one, it's just conditional expectation, it's a generating matrix. Now, for almost everywhere convergence, it's also important to look at some sort of truncated version of this expectation, and the truncation is based on the norm of the replacement matrix, truncated at N. Uh, if you are familiar with proofs of strong law of large number, uh, this shouldn't look very surprising because uh, general proofs of strong law of large number indeed uh, uh, indeed uh, requires uh, some truncation argument, and that's precisely what we are aiming at. And what is a balanced matrix? Uh, so uh, when you look at the norm, it's in terms of the row sums. So it's all row sums are same. And then without loss of generality, you take the row sum to be, uh, common row sum to be one, and that's called a stochastic matrix. So it's precisely, you can think it of as a stochastic matrix or a transition matrix in Markov chain. Uh, only thing the transition matrix becomes random as well. But uh, so uh, that kind of suggests that there is a close relationship between these R models and uh, uh, and and uh, a Markov chain uh, with the corresponding stochastic ma uh, matrix as transition matrix, and indeed there are, there is, and there is a very interesting approach uh, to study this R model uh, by embedding them in a sort of a Markovian system. But that that's another approach. We are not going to handle that. And whenever you have a stochastic matrix, and if you're familiar with Markov chain theory, uh, one of the things which plays a very important role is the notion of irreducibility. And uh, irreducibility is, uh, uh, in Markov chain, uh, it's defined through a, uh, through a equivalence relation called uh, called, uh, uh, called communicates, and uh, we won't get into uh, that because our our replacement matrix may not be stochastic. Uh, it may not even be balanced. Uh, so, uh, but we. So, what does what does irreducibility mean uh, in in uh, Markov chain? That starting from any state i, you can have a path and another state J, you can have a path of positive probability between the states I and J. Now, if you think it in terms of, uh, think it in terms of uh, the transition matrix or the stochastic matrix, all it requires is that for that pair I, J, there exists a power K, which may depend on I, J, such that the Kth power of H will have i j at entry strictly positive. Then there will be a path from i to j of length k. Right? 
if you think uh, if you know uh, a bit of markov chain theory and think about what irreducible means this one another equivalent definition and it does it, it can be defined for any matrix with non negative entry so this is our notion of irreducibility and if you think a bit about irreducibility if a matrix has to be irreducible then any row sum must have a non negative entry because if the ith row has all entries zero if the ith row is actually zero then from vertex i you cannot go anywhere you cannot reach to any state j so that sort of uh defects irreducibility uh, so if you have irreducible then all the row sum all the rows must have at least one entry positive since all entries are non negative so it will be minimum row sum which is sigma a that must also be positive so that's how this sigma comes in it sort of reduced to this uh, it sort of linked to this irreducibility concept okay so what do we know about uh, uh, so that was our model and its notation now what do we what do we know about the uh, what are the results known about the uh, our model so recall this is the evolution equation and now by and who so they studied in a, in a clinical trial setup and what this shown is if all entries of r and we assume on the fi finite moment so they assume Two plus delta moments, a bit more than two moments, finite. H n, which is the generating matrix or the conditional expectation of R n plus one, that's stochastic. That is all row sums are one, and you need another irreducible. So H n need not be irreducible, but it should be close to a irreducible stochastic matrix. H such that it's close in this sense that is the uh, distance between h and h when uh, scaled by n should be summable and you can uh, easily recall by chronicles lemma that will imply that this h n minus h norm will converge in cesaro sense that is the average of h n minus h that will converge to zero that's that's nothing but chronical slam and under this setup they show that uh, h has an almost sure limit and the limit is given by pi h which is a stationary distribution in sense of uh, markov chain and if you want don't want to use a markov chain language what does it mean so recall h is an irreducible stochastic matrix so all the row sums are one so if you think about it then if you look at all the eigen values of h the eigen value with the largest real part is actually one it's a real eigen value and it's one uh it has multi it, it has multiplicity one and all its left eigen vectors will have all coordinates strictly positive and among them among the left eigen vectors of h corresponding to eigen value one i choose one called pi h whose sum of the coordinates will be one so i make it a probability vector so that's called its distribution and here cn cn by n will converge almost surely to pi h actually by and who show something more they show that cn by n minus pi h that converges to zero almost surely but they also study uh the behavior of cn minus n pi h that scaled by n goes to zero almost surely but they uh, scale it uh, with something else to have a uh, uh, weak limit uh, uh, something like a central limit theorem result and for that they that's why they needed this additional moment they need instead of first moment they need two moments and uh, to push some of their results through they needed additional data because for central limit theorem you, it's it's it talks about a variance so you need the second moment 
Now, uh, after about uh, a decade, Larwell and Pages they took up the same prob uh, uh, problem of buy and who, but they could do it with only two moments. And uh, now, they, uh, instead of buy and who, who uh, required this notion of closeness, uh, Larwell and Pages assume that uh, that convergence is in Cesaro sense. And we saw that uh, by Chronicles Lemma, this is actually a stronger assumption. This assumption implies Cesaro convergence. So Larwell and Pages reduced moment, reduced uh, this uh, uh, closeness assumption, and they showed the same limit and they used Stochastic. So, uh, by and who used Martingale methods, they used stochastic approximation on CN by N. And that was inherently their weakness. They scaled it by N. So, their weakness was they, they required this limit still to be stochastic. Now, Zen uh, considered these things uh, around the same time and later. So they allowed H to be possibly unbalanced. And they allowed entries of Rn to have only L log L power 1 plus epsilon. It's a bit more than L log L mo moment finally. And again, the Cesaro closeness. Then they uh, studied in a similar fashion uh, using stochastic approximation on CN by N. In fact, what Zhang did in this 2016 paper, there was a, a mistake in Larwell and Pages paper, they fixed that. Uh, and as I said, when they did stochastic approximation, uh, so the stochastic approximation, uh, which Larwell and Pages did, uh, it was with H balanced, the uh, proof wasn't, the, the differential equation wasn't too bad. But when H is possibly unbalanced, uh, what Zhang got is a first order uh, differential equation where X dot is equal to a rational function of X. So, uh, I mean, it was pretty uh, difficult to analyze that ODE and they didn't come up with uh, so to show the uniqueness of the ODE, they have to, you know, like invoke a lot of general ODE theory and the proof became very complicated. So the question that became is, see, uh, for the first moment condition, uh, uh, sorry, for the... Uh, uh, Larwell Pages or Bayern who required two moments because they wanted central limit. But if I only want strong law of large number, then only first moment should suffice at least in the IID setup in some sense. Here they are requiring a bit more than L log L moments. So can I relax that those moment conditions? Can this limiting matrix H be random? And can we handle this ODE a bit more easily rather than invoking a uh, very difficult and complicated general ODE theory? So with that, we are ready to describe the assumptions that Ujan and I consider. So our H, it's irreducible and possibly random, and it's close to HN in the operator sense. So we look at the row norm of HK minus H. You remember that it is the largest, now this entries can be negative. So it's the largest absolute row sum, or maximum absolute row sum, or it's L1, L1 operator norm. And this uh, norm goes to zero in Cesaro sense in probability. That means this left-hand side for any epsilon positive, probably that this left-hand side is bigger than epsilon, that should go to zero. So I'll give you, so uh, and, uh, what I'm doing is I'll give you like two parallel sets of results. There are, there are like a, there are twin papers by Ujan and me. So in the first paper, what we did is we made these assumptions 
for convergence and probability and we obtain the results, the conclusions as convergence and probability. So that's kind of expected. And as I mentioned last time, uh, so for almost uh, so for stochastic approximation, also we have like this paired sort of results. And as I mentioned, uh, stochastic approximation in almost sure case it's part by part analysis and it's not uh, too different or difficult from the deterministic case. But when you do the convergence in probability case, it becomes a lot more tricky. I'll, I'll uh, recall that for you again. So there was this uh, uh, forward and backward debate sums corresponding to the forward and backward level crossing times. And they have to go to zero in probability. So you have to check that. And checking that is a bit tricky. I'll, I'll not do the details, but I'll give you the broad idea of how to handle those. And almost sure case, I just assume that this same object converges to zero almost surely. But here, instead of the generating matrix, as I mentioned, it's almost sure business. So uh, if you don't, if you're not willing to assume two moments, or maybe in cases four moments, uh, you have to work with the trunk and random variables. So we do precisely the same thing instead of each k, we work with h tilde k, which is a truncated conditional expectation. So this is this is sort of like I mean uh, there is nothing surprising. This has been uh, inherent in any proof of strong law of large number corresponding to first moment. You have to always do this truncation business. So uh, you can't really help this. So you may since you may be a bit uncomfortable with this H tilde thing. So you can replace this almost sure conditions by another set of sufficient conditions, which really imply this condition for almost sure thing. So what is that? That's the usual uh, closeness of H n to H, exactly like in convergence in probability, but only here I, I refer it almost surely. But since you are replacing this truncated one by the corresponding matrix, so you have to somehow take care of the remainder, which is the tail, you can, you can think about it like this H tilde is nothing but this object which indicated rho RK less than equal to K. And here you are looking at just rho RK. So you sh so HK will be H tilde K plus rho RK indicator, uh, you know, like for H tilde K you have rho RK indicator rho RK less than equal to K. And then you have this other term. So H tilde K is for the conditional expectation h tilde k is this h k minus this conditional expectation. So when you go into, uh, when you apply h tilde k minus h, it's h k minus h minus this conditional expectation. So when you uh, take, uh, you know, like uh, finally what you do is you strangle inequality. So this thing will be less than equal to this plus this, uh, so you want a sufficient condition. It will be, I mean, it's, it's sort of like immediate. If this will happen by triangle inequality, if both this and this go to zero. So, uh, for, uh, for convergence and probability, it's enough for that this go to zero in uh, probability. For almost sure, a sufficient condition is same thing, almost surely, plus this. Tail conditional uh, asymptotic uh, Cesaro negligibility. Again, it's only in Cesaro sense, the average. Uh, Cesaro negligibility of tail conditional expectation. So that's also required. That's an additional thing that you require. Somehow you have to manage that. Also, both of them require some sort of uniform integrability assumption because we are not making any IID assumption in general. So if things are IID, then the uniform integrability is built in as long as you assume for the first moment. But since we are not doing it, you have to have some uniformity. Uh, it's sort of like if things are too unlike each other, then I mean, what are you actually discussing about? If everybody is like different, then you can't have a common feature. So 
for in probability uh, setup, you require this sequence rho of Rn to be uniformly integrable. Now, what is uniformly integrable? Since many people may not be familiar with this literature, that means. Uh, so, what does what does it mean to say this random variable is integrable? So, uh, that means when you look at the corresponding integral for expectation, the tail integral should go to zero. Now, for each n, the tail integral will go to zero because all are integrable. But how far should you go to make the tail integral less than epsilon? That will depend on n. Uniformly integrable will require that if you go large enough, say bigger than say L, one single L, then the tail integral for all row RNs will be less than epsilon. So that's like uniform integrability. So given an epsilon positive, there exists an L positive such an expectation row Rn indicate that rho rn bigger than l should be less than epsilon. That's what, what we are talking about. So expectation of rho rn when rho rn is large uniformly, that should be smaller than epsilon. It shouldn't depend, that part of the threshold shouldn't depend on l. The usual notion of uniform ideas. And for almost sure, we always regard something more so you not only require that, uh, so this will kind of in, imply uniform integrability. So, so this will actually imply uniform integrability. So there actually exists a random variable R with finite mean, so that the tails of rho Rn will be bounded by tail of a, a multiple of tail of R. So this tail conditional expectation is, it can be it's a simple application of Fubini. It's nothing but integral of this object from L to infinity. Now, if this is bounded by this thing, then the corresponding integral will be uniformly bounded by C times integral of probability R bigger than X from L to infinity. And since R has finite mean, it's one single random variable, this thing can be made arbitrarily small by choosing a, a large enough. So by making this small, you can make all of them small. So this kind of implies uniform integrability. And this is typically called row RNs are majorized by this random variable R with finite. It's not saying like row Rn is less than equal to R, but what it essentially says that rho Rn is less than equal to R in some distributional sense. So that's why it's called majorized. So this majorization condition is very standard in probability and uh, you know, theory and statistics. So we're just, this, this uh, assumption is not too outrageous. And uh, this, these conditions, uh, either of them will imply that Hn will converge to H in L1. Caesar convergence of Hn to H will also be in first moment or in L1. Now remember that this Caesar negligibility of tail expectation that was the additional uh, assumption. It was an additional assumption you had for almost sure convergence. So can we? So the first. The first condition was exactly similar to convergence in probability, only in probability can be replaced by almost sure. But you have this additional assumption. So can we get some more nicer looking or more natural looking sufficient condition for that? And they are indeed are. So the following what are sufficient condition. So remember by and who required uh, L log L power 1 plus epsilon. It's a little more than a local condition. So what I require is that this majorizing, uh, so earlier I assumed that the majorizing random variable R must have finite expectation. It is expectation R is finite, but now I want a bit more. It must have a local condition. That is R log plus R that should have finite expectation. It still has to be a bit thinner. So that will imply this, number one. 
if this RNs are IID sequence, I mean, then that's sort of kind of uh, understandable because uh, it's typically the uh, strong law behavior, then also it will work. And third thing is if you can have a meteorization on the conditional uh, or a meteorization condition on, on, on this truncated object, that would also work. But uh, practically, this first will be most interesting. And this second one is very interesting because uh, these ARN models have a very interesting uh, connection with branching process. That was uh, essentially the PhD thesis of Krishna Atreya in uh, 70s last century or 40 years back. Uh, where he showed that the R models can be embedded into a continuous time branching process and all the results of R models can be read off from the results requiring the branching process, which already had a substantial literature by then and Atria uh, contributed to that. So what uh, Arthria required, you see, required this uh, for RNs to be ID sequence, he also required RNs to have L log L moments. But what we managed to show that even with uh, for independent sequence, ID sequence, it's not important to have a log L moments, it's good enough to have that R the ID sequence RN has on the first moment finally. And that sort of L level to L it's sort of like the, a big jump uh, in the proof. And uh, uh, so it's a big jump in the proof and uh, sort of you cannot go any below because you are if you are looking for a strong law of large number, you need to have a first moment. So that that's one of the big contribution of this. Uh, almost everywhere we are this specific sufficient condition for IID sequence. What are the assumptions on H? H has to be irreducible and that will give the minimum absolute rho sum to be positive. Maximum absolute rho sum is finite, that's obvious because it's only finite dimensional, but this becomes a crucial assumption when you do infinitely many colors. And here comes the peron frobenius theory. Since H has all entries non-negative, it has a peron frobenius eigenvalue. Uh, that is eigenvalue with the largest real part. That will be a simple eigenvalue. The corresponding left eigenvector will be pi H. And we can choose it to be probability vector with all entries strictly positive. And so probably I choose a probability vector to make it appropriately normalized. And the corresponding right, right eigenvector will be zeta h, so that it, this will also have all interest to be positive. These are all parent problems theory. And I can normalize the zeta h so that pi h dot zeta h is 1. Since uh, it's only a uh, finitely many colors, h is finite dimensional, we can always do that. For uh, infinitely many colors, there will be a lot of uh, issues which will appear here, but as I said, we are not getting into that. So these are the assumptions, and <coughs> under those assumptions, so and also you can uh, check from Peron Frobenius theory that lambda h, the Peron Frobenius eigenvalue, will lie between the minimum absolute rho sum and maximum absolute rho sum, and our result will depend in, involve lambda h as well as as you already saw this pi h. When things are balanced, this lambda h is 1, that's why in Baidu result, we only had pi h and no lambda h. So what we managed to show is that Cn by Sn converges to pi h. That's a configuration vector when scaled by Sn. So that's what we use using stochastic approximation. So the big difference that we, uh, big change that we make from the, uh, uh, make from the uh, Zhang's approach is he considered the stochastic approximation on Cn by n. 
<coughs> and that made the co uh, competitions very difficult in part one. This one by n for them worked as the step size for the stochastic approximation. We use one by Sn. That becomes our step size. That it's natural because then this becomes a proportion vector. Right? Cn, Sn is some of the uh, coordinates of Cn. So this becomes a proportion vector. So this vector then naturally lies in the probability simplex. It's a bounded object. So a lot of things become simpler, but the difficult part is in this one over Sn becomes a step size. And if one over Sn becomes a step size, uh, then it's a random step size. And that in case of convergence and probability creates some difficulties. But we uh, managed to show that it converges to pi h. And then we also managed to show that Sn by n converges to lambda h. And once you show these two things, it's kind of as expected straight, straightforward that Cn by n will converge to lambda h times pi h. It's sort of the product of these two. And also Nn by n converges to pi h. And I'm not saying what is the mode of the convergence because as I said, they are all, all twin results in the sense uh, convergence will be both almost everywhere and L1 or in probability and L1 depending on whether you make the almost everywhere assumptions or in probability assumptions. These are the results that we can obtain. So that will be our, that was our contribution. So before we uh, get into further details, any questions here? Okay. So, what do we do next is, uh, let's quickly recall spatial approximation. We discussed about it day before yesterday, but uh, it doesn't harm. So, this is the format of spatial approximation equation. Xn plus 1 is equal to Xn plus An, H of Xn plus An beta N. Beta N is the error. So, Xn will be bounded. And as I said, I'll be using Cn by Sn, the proportion as Xn. So that's proportion means it slides in the probability simplex, so naturally bounded, slides in some compact uh, set. And it, these are the error terms. So I'll, we'll have an appropriate error term in our system. I'll show it. I have to show that beta n goes to zero. Step size will require the condition that they are positive, they go to zero, but there's some diverges. <coughs> so if an is one by n, like uh, Larwell and Purchase or uh, Zhang did, then this is trivially satisfied. We'll be using one over Sn, and the way we'll be handling it is we'll be showing that Sn is roughly like n, asymptotically. And this driving function h from rk to rk has to be continuous. So we'll choose an appropriate one. And what we did is we uh, look at the partial sums of this should be at least the type which should be of n minus one. Uh, the partial sums is tn. And then we had this level crossing times that starting from n, how much more do you? Uh, more can we go up before we have to cross t or starting from n minus 1 how much low can we go before we have to cross t okay and based on that uh, we have the almost sure case that if uh, this ODH dot equal to HX has a unit solution uh, and the errors converge to zero in Cesaro sense, almost surely, then its end will converge to that unit solution evaluated at zero. And that's why I said like this keeps on shifting. And in probability case, you have this additional continuity assumptions of the driving function as well as the unit solution. And here you need this forward and backward delayed some errors rather than just beta is to converge to zero in, in Cesaro sense, you need something more. And then you have the same convergence in 
first moment or in L1 sense and hence it's in this in probability sense. So now what we do is let me give you a broad idea of the proof. So what our aim is to, this is our evolution equation, remember? So this is our configuration after n trials. And then I choose a color indicated by the sky n plus one. And then depending, I mean, if I'm choosing the ith color, I choose the ith row of this addition matrix, add them, and that puts me my n plus one at dimensional configuration. This is my evolution vector, and I say that uh, I'll not look at Cn, but I'll look at a proportion vector, which is Cn by Sn. So Cn by Sn, uh, I should have written it Cn, Cn minus 1, and things like that. So Cn by Sn, I can write it as Cn minus 1 by, not by Sn, but by Sn minus 1, so they have a match. And then uh, if we do some algebra, so we have we get the driving uh, function term multiplied by this rate and uh, so we break the error terms into two pieces uh, because we, we analyze them separately to consider it's just convenient. So step size is as I mentioned this is the an which I uh, uh, which we take as 1 over sn. And now comes this driving function. We have this subscript h because it's a function in x, but it's also indexed by h. We'll have different values of h. And as we said, h can be random, but it doesn't hurt us. So it is x times h minus x, x h1 transpose. This is a scalar, by the way, because x is a row vector, 1 is a column vector. So this is a scalar. This is a row vector, this is a row vector. So everything is fine. So we need to solve that x dot equal to hx. So x dot equal to this thing. And because of this two xs is a quadratic exp expression in x. So what we have is a first order quadratic differential equation. And uh, somehow both Mujan and I had a weak training in differential equations, which many of you would be, would be very good at here. Uh, and it took us quite a while. So that's that's like lotka voltaire equation, but it took us quite a while to figure out how to solve that. But it turned out that this particular form has a uh, pretty quick and neat solution. I'll, I'll come to that. It's uh, so easy that maybe, maybe, maybe many of you already would immediately see it. You can write it down explicitly in one slide. Okay. So as I said, I have two error terms. The dn is written in terms of some delta n. So it's this chi n times rn. This is the amount that you add in the n trial. You know, like if chi n is the color i, this gives you the ith row of rn. So it's the amount you add in the n trial. And if you think about it, this is nothing but the conditional expectation of this object. So for in probability convergence case, since I uh, work with the matrix, the condition, the, the non-truncated generating matrix, so we get it dn as delta n minus its conditional expectation. And in almost sure case, we work with the corresponding truncated condition of expectation. And in probability case, whatever remains is xi n. So this is, this turns out of a simplification is this driving function evaluated the same uh, proportional uh, proportion vector, but instead of h, we have h n minus 1 minus h. And in almost your case, it's almost there for your guessing, we should replace is hn minus 1 by h tilde n minus 1 plus 1 in truncated thing. So this is the setup and then we have to 
check all the conditions, the conditions in step size, the uh, behavior of the OD given by the driving function, and behavior of the error terms. Okay. So step size. So almost everywhere case, you essentially show that Sn by n, it's uh, bounded below the limb influence is bounded below by sigma h and uh, limb sub is bounded above by rho h. This is bigger than zero. This is finite. So that should take care of it. Actually, you should look at n times a n, which is n by s n, but doesn't matter. And then you know that comparing with one by n, one by s n goes to zero, or which is s n goes to infinity, or summation one by s n divergence. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, 1 by Sn goes to 0 because 1 by Sn is like 1 by n and summation 1 by Sn diverges because 1 by Sn is all a. This happens almost everywhere. And convergence in probability case, this is a bit more tricky. You cannot have such neat things. What you do is you compare Sn and n on a large probability set. That's what we do. So to do that, remember tau upper bar and tau lower bar were obtained by partially adding up the ANs, which in my case is 1 by SN. But I want to compare it with 1 by N. So I look at the level crossing time for the deterministic setup as well, which is 1 by N. And instead of tau upper bar and tau lower bar, I call the same things as T upper bar and T lower bar. And then it's you can sit down and check that this lower inequality is from the definition and you can also check the upper inequality and that sort of, uh, this is just like the harmonic series and that uh, behaves like a logarithmic thing. That's how it, that's how it turns out. And using that, you can check that for any AB, uh, this ratio is between A and B for all n in all n in this interval, uh, I call this set E and A B, and then this probability that this does not happen. That is uh, this S n. Uh, so I want to compare S n with n. So they are not comparable. They are beyond B and A. So this fails. That probability is bounded by sigma h is less than two b, and rho h is bigger than a by two. Now I know that sigma h is positive. So as, uh, as, as uh, and uh, so if you let b go to zero, then this probability will turn out to be zero. And rho h is finite, so if you let a go to infinity, this will uh, also go to zero. So given any epsilon positive, I can choose a large and b small enough so that this probability of the complementary event is less than 1 minus epsilon. So this happens with probability 1 minus epsilon. And once that happens, sorry, and once that happens, then with large probability Sn and N are comparable and that's good enough for us. Because we are only doing convergence in probability, we are not doing almost everywhere convergence here. Now, to handle the error terms, first of almost show case, we have the majorization condition and this majorization condition, so R has a finite first moment, so using moral cantilly lemma, it's sort of pretty quick uh, to check that uh, this fails rho Rn bigger than N. Uh, probability of that will be summable and then by force moral cantilever lemma that will have probability zero. So this will happen eventually with probability one. That's sort of a pretty straightforward exercise in uh, force moral cantilever lemma. And also uh, one can sit down and write down this expectation as appropriate integral and check that this thing, this sum is finite. So it's a truncated second moment scaled by n square that sum is finite almost sure. I don't know why I put almost sure, you don't need almost sure. There's nothing random over here. And also, I mean, uh, if you look at the definition of delta n, 
uh, it can be checked that it's bounded, it's not is bounded by twice rho r n, delta n is a uh, vector. And from that, I, we get this dn converges to zero almost surely in Cesaro sense because of the following. What is this average? This is this object. And we break it into delta n times the truncation and corresponding tail. Now, this object inside the first bracket that has conditional. Uh, Oh, I need a conditional expectation here. Uh, this has conditional expectation zero. And it can be easily checked because of this. Yeah, I, uh, now I know. I, have, I should have a conditional expectation. Yeah, then that's why I put up almost sure. Uh, so, but this will become an L2 bounded martingale. And because it's an L2 bounded martingale, this will converge on the string and the L2. That's from martingale theory. And when you come to the second term, you know that rho Rn exceeds n only often. So this indicator will be uh, positive only finitely many times for each omega. So this becomes this. Uh, sum has only, as Kaplan was repeating, the sum will, in the terms of the sum will be zero after a while. It is a finite sum. And uh, so this is a finite sum, so what you get that this thing is finite, as n goes to infinity, almost sure. And if this is finite, then uh, Chronicles lemma will be So, this is taken care of. And uh, for xi n, it's bounded by uh, twice the norm of this thing. And we know that uh, this difference between the truncated uh, generating matrix and H, that should go to uh, zero in Cesaro sense. So this should go to zero in Cesaro sense as well. So almost sure case, that's pretty much easy. What happens in the problem? Yes. Again, we have to look at that event, ENAB. And on that event, what we have to check is T bar NTA, that's less than equal to this object, that's by, uh, that we already checked, that comes from uh, the harmonic series. And also tau bar NT is less than equal to this, that you can also check because of uh, this condition. And as I said, you can make this make this event to have arbitrarily high probability. So this will happen with arbitrarily high probability. Now, uh, what you can show is that uh, for M going up to this upper level crossing time corresponding to one by N, for any uniformly uh, integrable martingale difference, this uh, error sum bigger than epsilon will go to zero. That's what you need, but only thing you need is here is the level crossing time corresponding to the a n, so one by s n, but we need for one by n. <coughs> if we can replace this by tau upper bar n, then this is what this is precisely the condition that means the convergence in probability condition that I need for stochastic approximation in probability. And uh, so both dk plus one and xi k plus one, they are uniformly integrable martingale difference. And we know that on this event, tau bar n is bounded by this. So if you uh, cover for all n between n and t bar, you will also cover for all n between n and tau bar, that's smaller than this. This one is a zero probability, and this one is a zero probability, and similarly over here. And similar thing you do for the lower level crossing terms. So that takes care of the error terms for convergence and probability. Yes, this uh, checking this condition for uniformly integrable martingale difference it's quite a bit technical, uh, and it uh, requires a lot of approximation and stopping and things like that. I'm not going into those details. Now comes the OD part. So recall this is our 
This is our driving function. So this is the uh, OD that we have to solve. And as I said, this is a first order quadratic differential equation, which is a lot of order type. And you can actually reduce it to a first order linear differential equation for which uh, there are standard exponential solutions. So how do we do it? We, we actually make two change of variables. So look at, for H, look at the Jordan decomposition. H equal to VJU, where is J, so you may not be able to diagonalize it. So you have this Jordan matrix, J, and then U and V are the Jordan vectors. So UV equal to VU equal to I. And lambda, so the first entry of uh, this Jordan matrix J is this eigenvalue with the largest real part, the parent provenance eigenvalue, and we know it's simple, so the corresponding Jordan block will be scalar. So it's J11 is lambda H. And the corresponding uh, left Jordan vector will be the eigenvector. If the eigenvectors are there, they are there, they are the Jordan vectors. So U is the matrix, the rows of U are the left, left Jordan vectors. So the first one will be pi H. And columns of V will be the <coughs> columns of V will be the right uh, Jordan vector. So the first one will be zeta H. The first one is the parent provenance right and again vector. And uh, the I thing comes up because we normalize things so that pi H dot zeta H is one. And my first uh, so V is non-singular, so it's a non-singular transformation. I change. Uh, x to y using the transformation y equal to x v and note that y1 will be so y is a row vector the first entry will be you take the first column of v so that's in zeta h transpose so x zeta h transpose now recall in our case we are looking at cn over sn that's a proportion vector so that's a probability vector so x is a probability vector so y remains bounded. And also zeta h has all coordinates strictly positive. And x is non-zero, it's a probability vector. It's a non-zero vector multiplied by a vector which has all coordinates strictly positive. So y1 has to be strictly positive. And z will be y divided by y1, since y1 is strictly positive. So z is nothing but y normalized so as to force so as the first coordinate is one okay and then you can do a little bit of algebra to check that this uh, differential equation in uh, x turns out to be this differential equation in Z, which is Z dot equal to Z J minus lambda H I, which is nothing but a first order linear differential equation. And then everybody knows that this will have the solution Z T is equal to Z zero to the power T J minus lambda H I. And uh, we have to show that this is a unique solution. It depends on Z zero. Now observe that for i bigger than one, real part of jii, real part of jii, they are nothing but the, it's a diagonal, so diagonals of the Jordan matrix are nothing but the eigenvalue, and all the eigenvalues will have real part, strictly less than lambda h, that's a parent probability theory. So I mean the first one is lambda h, and all the rest will, it's, it's uh, of uh, simple multiplicity. Can be strictly less than. So here, what we have here, the diagonal elements, except for the first uh, uh, ones, are J i i minus lambda h. So the real part is the real part of J i i minus lambda h, which is negative, right? So as uh, t goes, so so here you get get the real part negative. So as t goes to minus infinity. Uh, this real part negative multiplied by t that will go to infinity and this will become unbounded. This will go unbounded. So z t will go unbounded in all the coordinates of the first one. 
and uh, and and that and that is not allowed uh, because uh, after all uh, z is supposed to be bounded so what must happen is that z not must have all but the first coordinate all but all but the first coordinate must be all all but the first coordinate must be zero and what is the first coordinate of z it has to be identically one <coughs> so z not has to be e1 and then it's actually uh, z not has to be e1 and then uh, you trace back because they are all uh, non singular transformations so you get xt equal to y1 t pi h pi h comes from v inverse which is u and u has first uh, row pi h now recall x will be cn by sn which is a proportion vector so this has to be a proportion uh, probability vector a proportion vector pi h is already a probability vector so that implies y1 t has to be necessarily 1 so x has to be xt has to be identically pi h x has to be constant that is actually what you are solving for is this equation, uh, this 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 uh, hx small hx is equal to zero, and that's something I already uh, alluded to in my comments last time that the way you solve for it is you don't actually go for the differential equation, you solve for a constant solution, so you solve for the right hand side of the differential equation equal to zero but that's the that's something you have in mind but this is how you do it explicitly and this pi h becomes in the limit of cn by sn but uh, to do that uh, we at least for the convergence in probability we need to show that this solution is con uh, continuous in h this is a left eigenvector uh, there are many ways to show it, but there is a cute uh, little proof which I always find very interesting, so maybe I'll share that. So I'll write down pi h in terms of the inverse of this matrix. Okay? And to do that, I have to first show that this matrix is invertible. So you have to show that null space of this matrix is trivial. So suppose x is in the null space of this matrix. So times x is equal to zero transpose. And then multiply both sides by pi h, that will be zero, scalar zero. And if you multiply this matrix on the left by pi h, pi h h is lambda h because pi h is the left eigenvector of h corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda h. So these two terms disappear. So you have pi h1 transpose. What is pi h1 transpose? That's a probability vector. So pi h1 transpose is 1. So you are left with 1x transpose. So you know that 1x transpose or sum of entries of x must be 0. And that implies this matrix of all 1s, right multiplied by x will give me the 0 matrix. And then I plug it in over here. So this term disappears, so I get h x transpose is equal to lambda h x transpose. That means x must be a right eigenvector of h corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda h. If x is in the null space of this matrix, then it must be a right eigenvector of h corresponding to the eigenvalue lambda h. Cool. And uh, then x is the uh, right eigenvector of the matrix H plus lambda H I corresponding to the eigenvalue 2 lambda H. And two la lambda H is the eigenvalue with the largest real part corresponding to H. So 2 lambda H will be the eigenvalue corresponding to the, uh, the, the eigenvalue with the largest uh, real part corresponding to this matrix. And then from the eigenvalue theory, you get uh, you look at the powers of this matrix and take C0 sum, then that should converge to, uh, and also this is a right eigenvector corresponding to lambda h, so you get this limit. That's a standard uh, theory from linear algebra. And uh, 
and and uh, from that uh, I get and and also I know that uh, if I multiply this thing by x transpose, I'm in finite dimensions. So all sums will be finite here when you do the matrix multiplication. If you multiply by x transpose, then this will be nothing but its average of x transpose. So that will give you x transpose. And also this limit will be this thing times x transpose. So I have this thing. And then I look at one x transpose that I already know to be zero. So that is one zeta h transpose pi h x transpose. Now zeta h has all entries strictly positive. So this cannot be zero. Then this must be zero. That is x must be orthogonal to pi h. And uh, therefore, uh, and then uh, what you do is you uh, again multiply by zeta h transpose, you get x transpose, which must be zero. So anything which is in the null space must be zero. So this thing must be non-singular. And then you look at pi h times this thing, that's because uh, pi h is the left eigenvector and quickly simplifies to be the vector one. So pi h is non-singular, so you can invert pi h is this thing. And since inverse is inverse and eigenvalues are uh, continuous functions, pi h thus defined is also continuous function. The technical thing is the eigen, when you talk about eigenvector, it's not unique. So when you talk about continuity and things like that, you have to make sure which eigenvector uh, you are talking about. We are talking about the one which is normalized to be a probability thing. Anyway, so finally we have already shown that CN, CN by SN converges to lambda H. Now we have to show that SN by N converges to lambda H. So we write SN by N as SN by N minus its conditional expectation and then whatever I add and so that becomes CN minus SN minus one, HN one transpose, I bring in H one transpose and I do that. So the first term is a martingale different, a martingale. So by Kronecker uh, and truncation, you can show that this converges to zero. And by uniform integrability, this will also be zero in L1. The second one is zero because this Hn minus H goes to zero, Cesaro sense in norm. So you, uh, you are looking at a quadratic form here that will also go to zero. So all that remains is this thing. Now you already know that Cn by Sn goes to uh, pi h. So Cn by Sn h1 transpose will go to pi h h1 transpose, which is pi h times h is lambda h pi h because of the eigenvalue. And pi h is a probability vector, so it's lambda h. So it will also converge in Cesaro sense. So Sn will con by n will converge to lambda h. And once that is done, using Cn by Sn and Sn by n, you can go to Cn by n. So that takes care of this thing. And finally for n, n by n, again I, uh, n, n is nothing but sum of the sky n's and I center it by its conditional expectation and then we adjust it. And the first one, it's bounded, so it's an L2 bounded martingale difference, and then it goes to zero, so I only have to handle this thing, but Cn by Sn converges to pi h, so by, it will also converge to pi h in Cesaro. So that completes the proof. So that gives you the result about Sn by N, Cn by N, and Ln by N in all cases using stochastic approximation. So I think I'll stop here. Okay. Uh, is there any question from the participant? Check the chat box if there is any. No, there is no question uh, written. So, if any question comes from the participants, then please ask.
I don't think there is no such question, perhaps. Uh, okay, in that case, uh, let us thank uh, Dr. Krishanu Modik for his uh, very wonderful talk. And he's in two different talks. He, in the first talk, as done the day before yesterday, he showed us uh, the main assumption and the main principle about the approximation in the stochastic processes. And today, he showed some advanced uh, applications for that one. So these are very wonderful. I believe all the participants got some kind of benefit about this particular subject. So let us thank uh, Dr. Molik for these uh, wonderful talks. And I request Dr. Molik, uh, if possible, uh, can you provide the slides of these two talks so that okay. I can show yeah, you? Yeah, sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll maybe uh, I'll, tonight, I'll, as, as I was uh, going through the slides, there are a few typos. I'll try to fix them and okay. then share it's them. okay, no problem. Yeah. Okay. So, I may not be able to fix all the typos. The ones which I remember, I'll try to fix them. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's not an issue. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank yeah. you very much. So by this thank note, you. let us uh, thank you. And uh, by this note, let us complete this first session of today's uh, entire program. So we will meet uh, once again at uh, 7 p.m. And uh, that talk will be delivered by Professor Ali Khani, as we know, that's per the schedule. So we will meet at 6.55 in Indian Standard Time and so that we can start positively by 7. Thank you very much. And thank you, sir. Thank you.